angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy, eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. Why are so many hidden messages in the first five books of the Bible pointing to the very year in which you are watching this? This is Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert in studio with our, well, my best friend, my wife, and our science editor, Sharon K. Gilbert, Hi, and our guest talking about a fascinating concept called the Torah Codes, producer of a film, The Torah Codes, End to Darkness, the man behind Pinlight Films, Richard Shaw. Richard, welcome back. Thank you very much. It's great to be back again. This was a fascinating <laughs> conversation last week, and we barely scratched the surface, and of course, we, you left us with a, a, a tease, which is good broadcast practice. Leave people <laughs> wanting more. Want, you know, tune, tune in next week sure. for more. Um, but there seems to be, uh, in, in the Torah codes, um, these messages that point to 5776, the Jewish year, which is the very period of time in which we live right now. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Right now, what's, what's really hot is the gematria about the year of 5776. And I know Tom Horn just wrote a book about Mm -hmm. How, why yeah. does this year come up? Right, Seems even in ancient texts, mm -hmm. the right. Vilna Gaon mentions it. All of that. In fact, there's there's a prophecy that the Vilna Gaon made back in the 1700s that said, when Russian ships cross through the Strait, the Bosphorus Strait, uh -huh. then the Messiah will come. Yeah. Now that's kind of what's happening on the Bosphorus Strait. Now this is this is really weird. When I was talking with Ellie Marzulli about this, because this was something that I was learning from my rabbi friends, that. <clears throat> People don't really know where that is. I mean, right. it's it's a strait that connects two bodies of water, and the the lower one is called the Sea of Marmara, and the strait goes right past uh, the city of Istanbul. Right. Mm -hmm. So if if you if you went into the Sea of Marmara and you went west just a few miles, you'd be at Combergas, mm -hmm. and Combergas is where the, the most major UFO sighting of all time happened. No, I did not know that. I, I didn't think know. if you ask any American, we'd say, well, Roswell. Exactly. Yeah. No, this is where a, a UFO appeared three years in a row, and the last one, uh, which was in Watchers 9, I did an analysis on it where you could actually see beings inside moving around, turning their heads, all of that kind of thing. Now, that is just like a few miles from where the Russian ships are supposedly entering the mm -hmm, Sea of Marmara, because mm -hmm. that's where the, the craft was hanging over the Sea of Marmara. I mean, this mm. is like, <clears throat> and I'm not kidding with this. Yeah. This is a real thing. When I first got involved with the rabbis, I was really afraid to even breach the topic of UFOs, because it sounds like you're crazy or conspiracy theorist or something like that. Right. I knew they were real. There's just too much evidence. Well, you're, you're in good company here, because we're all already labeled as, uh, you know, members of a sci-fi <laughs> apocalyptic prophetic cult. So I have I, several I can't versions worry about of it. my Hat, That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't worry about what people think of me. It's like, okay, I know this is real. I've had too much experience with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you don't like it, you know, don't listen to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there's so much information about, about all of that. And uh, I was afraid to even broach the topic with Rabbi Glederson until he comes out <laughs> on his own volition. We got to talking about the flood or something, and he was at my studio it's so much fun talking with him. I just, I, it's really a lot of fun talking with Rabbi Glederson. But he said, uh, we've got to talk about the Tower of Babel. And he said, oh, yes, it was a launching platform for space vehicles. Hmm. That's interesting. Now, all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, the idea of building a tower into heaven, mm -hmm. it, it takes on a different concept. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, we've talked several times about how it, how it actually was a gateway. So, yeah. 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 And, but see... Uh, Jews that are, that are studying at that level, that are serious about what they're studying, expect all this stuff to happen before the Messiah occurs. I mean, this is like just old hat to them. It's mm -hmm. like, oh yeah, well, uh, you know, the UFOs are going to be around, and there's or these beings are going to, you know, appear. It's part of what they what's in their ancient Jewish mystical texts. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems that there, there's almost <coughs> a, a week doesn't go by that we don't hear another proclamation mm -hmm. from. 
Israel from an Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox rabbi that uh, the time of the Messiah is coming soon, that he's here imminently. The, the Vilna Gons prophecy, in fact, also included a reference to Russia taking the Crimea, which it, it did in the, uh, yeah. you know, the Crimean War, Very but it also so. did again in March of 2014. So that's mm -hmm. been fulfilled as well. Yeah. And of course, with Russia and Turkey fussing over their policies in Syria, the Russia could wind up in Constantinople before we know it as well, uh, Istanbul. Nothing at this point would surprise me with the Saudis amassing 350,000 troops and all of that. Right. It's like, what's going on over there? Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy. But some of these tables, which, which I'll give you here, uh, you know, the, uh, according to ancient Jewish mystical texts as well, like the Zohar, the Midrash, they believe that at the time of the, the Messiah, there also is going to be this planet that appears. It says new stars will be seen, will be discovered during the time of Messiah. Now, just recently we had Caltech say that they've just discovered planet nine. Now they haven't seen it, but they can tell because of its perturbations of other planets, there's a very large body out there somewhere, mm -hmm. yeah. at least seven to 10 times the size of the earth. Now, oddly enough, Gil Broussard calls his website planet 7X. Right, right. Because he's believed that all along and, and he's going with with uh, some really great information back in 1054 where the China, in China they saw this planet <coughs> pass through and evidently this planet comes a lot more frequently than anybody ever imagined and yet the earth isn't destroyed every time because mm -hmm. it, it depends on how far away it is when it passes. Mm -hmm. This time we don't we aren't so sure what's going to happen. Yeah. It, it's like so there's this this table I have here it says Nibiru, which is the Nibiru, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. uh, sometimes the way it's referred to, 5776, a threat. And now those are, those two um, lines of text are in parallel with each mm -hmm. other. And also the word Purim is in there. Now that's like this month. Oh, wow. Okay. A lot of people are saying it's going to happen on the 26th of March, where we start seeing this thing. And, and typically in scripture, when things go crazy, the parting of the Red Sea, all these things, it happened during that time of year, according to Gil Broussard, mm -hmm. and I believe he's right. Uh, there's another one here. It says the threat of comet. Again, Nibiru, the stars of the host of the sky. That's mm. in the plain text. And it says, lift up your eyes to the sky. Another thing in the plain text. Oh my goodness. Stars of the sky. And then the, the date 5776 is in there. Now, now we don't know mm -hmm. what that means. We're, we're baffled by why 5776 keeps appearing in so many code tables. Here's another one, threat, star, will be spoken. Everybody's talking about it, 5776, hmm. the time of the coming of Nibiru. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and this That's is pretty uh, specific. It is. And, and by the time th this program airs, we will be well into this period. So mm -hmm. we may be able to confirm this by then. But yeah. in fact, Sharon and I have talked on a recent Sci Friday program, uh, which is on the Skywatch TV uh, website and, and Roku channel. Uh, about a uh, the SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence program, um, searching for the parent body of a meteor shower that appeared over New Zealand unexpectedly on New Year's Eve. They, it, these hmm. meteor, unlike the, the, uh, the, the, the Leonids and the Perseids, mm -hmm. which appear every year at the same time right. and in the same part of the sky because of the orbit of the Earth, these had never appeared before. They weren't tracked on radar. So astronomers are concerned that maybe there's something new in the solar system that we don't know about yet, and they're looking to find out where these things came from because there might be something else behind it. Right. Well, we also talked on, on that same show, I think, <clears throat> that we were discussing new story about how Mars supposedly uh, tilted on its 20 axis, degrees right. because they say a volcano. But I'm looking at this one that has uh, Adar and the time of the coming of Nibiru. It also has Mars in there. Yeah. I don't know why Glazerson put that, and I have to ask him that. Yeah, maybe that maybe he believes Mars will be affected. I mean, Mars was whacked on the backside really hard at some time mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. our past, and we have an asteroid belt out there right. mm -hmm. because something got whacked. And the and the Bible refers to Rahab. Yeah, yeah. which some uh, uh, interpret as that being the name of the planet that uh, formerly occupied the space between Mars and Jupiter. Yeah. And the planet Venus is postulated by uh, Emmanuel Velikovsky that it once was a comet, and ended up as a planet in orbit, and that's why it still has such a high. Uh, surface temperature. It's 800 degrees surface temperature. Mm, very mm. warm. That, that's really intriguing. Well, just as the uh, coming of Messiah for Christians, of course, in the uh, first century was heralded by a star, 
it appears that the Torah codes are pointing to the emergence of another star and the Messiah's next appearance. We'll talk about that as Skywatch TV continues right after this. From the time she was little, Nita dreamed of horses. Every childhood fantasy rode on the back of a heroic white steed, coming to save the day. I don't know how long I've had this love in my heart for horses. It's just always been there. And when we were little girls, my sister and I would play all day long. I was always the white horse and she was always the little pink pig. But everything changed in a heartbeat. On December 9th, 1971, a tragic car accident claimed the life of my dad and my best friend and my little sister. And I wondered after that if there was anything left to believe in. As a child of 13, I felt like I had lost practically everything. And I wondered, is this it? I mean, where do I go from here? I could not have imagined back then how God could use horses, of all things, to restore my faith and vision for the future. Starting April 19th, get your copy of Nita Horn's inspirational new book, No Fences, and learn for the first time her amazing story of loss, survival, determination, and healing. How the vision and love God gave her for these beautiful and majestic animals eventually led to the 150-acre Whispering Ponies Ranch, a general retreat facility, as well as a premier training location that specializes in using and gifting therapeutic animals to benefit the herding, other care facilities, schools and ministries across the nation. When God puts something in your heart, it's there for a lifetime. The Torah codes, are they an integrated message system from outside our time domain? Did God put messages inside the first five books of the Bible that only now in the 21st century late 20th, early 21st century are, that we're able to decode. We're talking with filmmaker Richard Shaw in his film, Torah Codes and Darkness. I want to ask a question that we, we actually were talking about before we started recording this program, and that's in the book of Revelation. John is told that there's a, an angel holding a little book in his hand, and he's told to eat it, and he says, this will be sweet in your mouth, but it would be bitter in your belly, and then he's told to seal it up. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that it's referring to this. Well, uh, the way you would seal something is to encrypt it. Yes, Especially if yes. people mm -hmm. are already reading it. I, I really believe that uh, firmly, that you know, these kind of encryptions, we, uh, w the time of the end means that uh, if, if this is the time of the end, if we are actually living in the time of the end, and most, a lot of people believe that we are, because of, there's just unexplainable things happening all over the world. We didn't have computers to the extent that we do today in the comfort level of it and the, and the software written to do it. That's kind of like a, a way to unlock when these things are supposed to be known. Uh -huh. And it's taken years for people to even know that the Torah codes exist. And a lot of people 
poo-pooed it and said, oh, well, you can find codes in any text, sure. you know, with a powerful, and that's true, but like th the propensity for those codes to be as clustered together and in such a small space with so many, with so few characters, or even using skips that are, that the, the number of the skip itself is meaningful, like the secret number of God, mm -hmm. which we talk about in one of the, the videos on my website, which they can just watch for free. Um, and that's at endtodarkness.com? Mm -hmm. Endtodarkness.com, okay. yeah. That's E-N-D, yes. end to darkness. Yeah, it's not into, it's not like the Star <laughs> Trek I was movie. gonna say, <laughs> Star Trek isn't coming after you. That's a yeah. slightly, yeah, a yeah, slightly yeah. larger budget. It, it, meaning that the way that phrase came up was that uh, Blazerson looked that up in the Torah codes. It said "end to darkness," and that happened in the year 5736 when Professor Rips found out about the code. Ah. That's what that's it means. That's what it means. End yeah. to the darkness. Yeah. That, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, you know, I, I'm curious now, and, and I don't want to go too far afield from from some of these fascinating um, clues that are coming out of the codes. But the, the rabbis that you've come to know during your, the time of your relationship with them, how has their research into this phenomenon affected their faith? Well, Professor Rips was kind of raised an atheist originally, and, and his story is, is in the film. Yeah. It's really powerful. I found it really moving, yeah. I mean, he tried to, to protest the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia by setting himself on fire. Mm. And people rushed up and put him out, and he was immediately whisked off to a psychiatric prison. And so some, uh, when they let him out, uh, they, he was transported to Israel. Uh, from what I understand, a bunch of mathematicians got together to save this guy because he was so brilliant. And they mm. brought him there. And he saw this tremendous outpouring of Judaic you know, worship of God. He didn't really, he'd never seen anything like that before. And he realized that the big thing that they were all studying was the Torah. So he started reading it. And what really moved me when I interviewed him in the film, he said, I realized that the Torah was a book of miracles. Hmm. And here's his, he's a scientist. So he had to prove that the Torah was real. And the only way he could do this, I, and he told me, he said, I didn't have money to go do archeological digs. I couldn't, you know, f try to figure out if it's real that way but I could do it through mathematics because that's what he knew how to do. Mm -hmm. So when he got this, this information from Rabbi Yaniv, he went into it and got a couple other guys going to it and that's how we have the Torah code that wow. we have today. What a story. You know, his, his life story would make an amazing movie, don't you think? Oh, it is. I mean, he's an amazing guy. I have the highest respect for Professor wow. Rips. It's amazing that he survived uh, yes. trying to set himself on Clearly fire. Clearly the Lord yeah. had plans for him. Yeah. These, these are gifted rabbis. I mean, Professor Rips is uh, brilliant and humble, and you feel like you're in the presence of a great person when you're hanging out with him. Hmm. Mm. The, the emergence of a star. Again, the birth of Jesus was heralded by a star. Right. And we see in Torah codes, we also see in prophecies I included in some of the Jewish mystical texts, like the Zohar, the emergence of a star. Right. Um, what does the Zohar say about it? What are they finding in the Torah codes about it? And is there a time frame assigned to these uh, messages? Well, yeah, I mean, it's uh, Nibiru, from the sky to earth, in the month Adar, which I believe is uh, March, hmm. because it kind of bridges March and April. That's what I was thinking. Threat of a star. 5776, and then it says comet. Now, what's interesting with this is that a lot of these tables have parallel words, but yet there is a lot of disagreement among the rabbis about whether this should be done or not. I mean, some of them, Rabbi Glazerson is, is, is a free thinker. He thinks way outside the box, and I'll say, I don't know, I'll, I'll mention something to him. Everybody's talking about Planet X, and I'm not sure what has encouraged that but there's so much. I mean, if you go on Google and you look up Planet X, there's like millions <laughs> of hits. Mm -hmm, okay? mm -hmm, yeah. And I, I told that to Glazerson. The next thing I know, he's on this quest to find Torah codes about Planet X. Mm. But, but then it also fits into the Jewish mystical text. So he feels like this is something he should be doing. But none of us expected him to come up with all of this. I mean, this is like more information. So we're, we're just saying, why? What does this mean? Is there something important going to happen, or is it, is it because everybody's talking about it that we're seeing this? That could also be the reason mm -hmm. that people are interested in it, and so it comes up, well, this year everybody's talking about it, and it, but we have these tables about Nibiru. Mm -hmm. That may be the, all that it's about. We don't mm -hmm. know. 
the, the idea that, that knowledge will increase and that, uh, and that things are being unsealed, that this is an end to darkness, um, I- indicating the, the prophetic fulfillment that, that, uh, of, of uh, uh, the, the messages from, from the Torah. Um, y- you talked before in our last program about some of the conversations you've had with Rabbi Glazerson uh, about faith. He is a, 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 a Jewish rabbi and you are a Christian. Right. And so we have a fundamental difference about who the Messiah is, that, that second power in heaven, Yahweh, but not Yahweh. Well, I'll ask, um, I said, well, who, who do you think then is the Messiah? That, that was a question. You know, who do they see as the Messiah? Yeah. Well, he, he thinks it's either Moses or Elijah because that fits into their, uh, their teachings more than anything else does. And mm-hmm. of course, in the Old Testament, it talks about uh, Elijah heralding the coming of the Messiah. Right. Now, the Christian faith, it was like John the Baptist, but right. some even refer to John the Baptist as a form of Elijah, mm-hmm. you know. And and yet, a lot of the, the scriptures in the Old Testament that refer to uh, Yeshua are either misunderstood or ignored by the ultra-Orthodox community. Now, why that is, I don't quite understand. They always have a reason for why they believe that, and, and I'm not about to get in an sure. argument with yeah. them mm-hmm. about that because I love them all. And that doesn't, that isn't helpful. No, no. But uh, there are so many, to me, the way, the reason I'm convinced it's Yeshua is because you opened Psalm 22 and it's, you know, it says, mm-hmm. my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right, mm-hmm. right. You know, and you open up Zechariah 12 and it says, they will look upon him on whom they pierce pierced and him. weep, yes. you know, for him as a lost son. In Isaiah 53, he was wounded for our transgression, he's bruised for our iniquities. You know, it's like we dumped all of our sins upon him and by his stripes we were healed, you know. It's, mm-hmm. it, if that's not what happened yeah. during the crucifixion, I don't know. And yet Daniel, who, da- who nailed his arrival in Jerusalem to the year, and so right. I say to the day. Yeah. 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 So to me, all those things are meaningful. They're in the Tanakh. They're in the Old Testament. Even if I didn't believe the New Testament was true, I still have all of this in the Old Testament to look at and go, well, what about that? Then? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know. So I'm convinced through those passages that that we know who we're talking about now. One thing that happened which is just recently, which is very, very interesting, is that there was a, a kid that was 15 years old, yeah. and his name was uh, Nathan, and he died and was dead for eight minutes, and he had an out-of-body experience. Now, I really take those seriously. Now, not all of them are, you know, some of them could have been dreams, some of them could have been hallucinations, but when someone has something this vivid and this detailed, I... I tend to consider it that the guy really had this happen to him. He said he went up to heaven, all his sins were there, and all of the good things he's done and bad things were weighed. It's very, it's very Judaic mm-hmm. in the way he described mm-hmm. it. It was really, really sweet. He's sitting in a room full of rabbis telling the story in Hebrew, and this is all on the internet. It's gone viral. I mean, you can find this, the story that Nathan has about his near-death experience. But he was asked, well, so did they, you get any indication of when the Messiah would return? 20 years, 10 years, one year? And he said, imminent. It was imminent. He hmm. said, even at the door. Hmm. And they were, the door. his mouth fell open. And then he said, and there's going to be a war. And he said, it's going to happen. He's like, we're already at war now. But he said, when the, real, when the actual war starts, everyone will know it'll be boom. And the war has started, is hmm. what he said. Hmm. And he went into great detail about it. He said, and then the Messiah will reveal himself. He said, the Messiah is already here and been here, but no one knows who he is. Hmm. But he will reveal himself. And a lot of people, he said, will be surprised when they find out who he is. Hmm. Now, all this is coming out of a 15-year-old kid who hasn't studied any of this stuff. Hmm. Well, the famous rabbi who passed away a few years ago, yes. who left the name Rabbi of, Yitzhak yes. Kaduri, yeah, and left the name and, and said the name of the and I yeah. asked the Jesus, other rabbis Yeshua. about it. I yeah. said, so what about Rabbi Kaduri? You know, he was like 102 or something when yeah. he passed away, and he was like one of the most venerable rabbis there. Oh, actually the streets, healed people. Yeah, the streets were choked with people mm-hmm. for his uh, it the funeral like service. It looked like a major funeral. Yeah, yes. they said, oh, it's not true. It's a hoax. It's you know, they they immediately disproved it, that could have been ri- true. And then also, it, it, he didn't actually say Yeshua. It was like it was some it other... Was, there was a little code. Yeah, it was, yeah. It, it was encoded yeah. in the message. We took the first letter of the words or some, some such thing like yeah. that. But, uh, yeah. 
But interesting, uh, Nathan, the kid who died in a second video, which is a really goofy one where they use chroma key and all sorts of stuff and crazy effects, and it, it kind of took away from what the truth of his message, said that he saw three rabbis while he was in heaven, and one of them was Kaduri. Oh, hmm. my. The fact that he mentioned that I thought was insightful. Yeah. Now, huh. he never says anything about Yeshua. Mm -hmm. But in Watchers 9, we interviewed a guy who was... Uh, uh, a pastor for in Iran and he said that Jesus was appearing to people yes personally mm -hmm. in Iran now this was a guy way out in the sticks and he got a knock on the door he opens it up and there's this man in glowing white raiment that walks in the house and said I want you to write this down and so he goes okay <laughs> I mean what would you do so he writes it down, and, and he's being dictated the entire book of John. Hmm. Oh, my. And he, and he fell asleep while he was writing it, and this man in white disappeared, and the next night he came back, and let's continue. <laughs> and he finished the book. <laughs> and it was in it Farsi or whatever language? Yeah. They yeah. Were. yeah. And we've been hearing stories like that from areas where it is dangerous for Christians, the Holy Spirit going to war. We have just about a half a minute left yeah. here, so we want to make you aware of how you can get a copy of End to Darkness, um, the, the book about, or the movie rather, about the Torah codes, the deluxe package, including a DVD and the Blu-ray version. So you have one for yourself, one for a friend perhaps. Uh, $17.95 plus shipping and handling. And as a bonus, we'll add the audiobook version of Tom and Nita Horn's novel, The Araman Gate. Both of those for you. $17.95 from skywatchtvstore.com. We could go on for hours. This is fascinating. Richard Shaw, Pinlight Productions, the website endoddarkness.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek. And thank you for watching as we keep watch. For Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. To celebrate the release of Nita Horn's inspiring new book, No Fences, Skywatch TV would like you to tell your story, because after all, even if you don't think so, you actually have a story. Send in your story, and we are going to choose the 10 best, and they'll be published for Christmas release in an anthology of those stories, along with the book that you uh, buy that is Actually, only 19.95. Am mm -hmm. I right on that? That's correct. For free, Tom Horn, crazy guy. He's throwing in a journal, which on its own, these most of these retail for twenty dollars on their own. So this journal is to help you start writing your story. Mm -hmm. When you buy the book, not only are you going to be uh, enrolled in this, and you can send in your story, but you'll get a plastic pony, you'll mm -hmm. get a journal of your own, and the proceeds from the book are going to help fund the studio we're building for Skywatch Women. Mm -hmm. And Nita Horn is going to be one of our panel members. The 10 authors who are selected for the anthology published by Defender Publishing in time for Christmas will also receive a $500 cash and prize. That, uh, that'll go a long way at Christmas time, won't it? <laughs> yes, it will. Even if your story is not one of those selected for the anthology, if you've taken the time to write your story, you've left a legacy for your children and for your grandchildren. Amen to that. For complete instructions and uh, details on this uh, opportunity, please log on to skywatchtv.com slash no fences.